www.ncpsa.com. You can also join in the conversation by using the hashtag and tweeting at us via hashtag TV3 Security Forum. Don't miss out on that as well to get all the latest updates from the forum online. So you're welcome to our Thought Leadership Forum, examining security in Ghana, options for action. But before we continue, let's welcome Acting General Manager for News here at Media General, Mike Otieje, for opening remarks. A round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Jifa. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for finding the time this morning to come through. I want to say a special thank you as well to our distinguished panelists. Uh, we know the way weekdays can be, especially on a rainy morning like this, so we're grateful that you've joined us here. I think essentially Jifa set the ball rolling um, by giving us sort of a preamble to why we think this is important uh, around this time of the year. The number of security issues that has happened in the first quarter. On behalf of the Group Chief Executive of Media General Beatrice Hajima, I welcome you here once again. Essentially what we want to do is that we want to begin to offer a platform to have big conversations about the big national issues. And we think that security issues is a key part of them. But also our tagline for this morning's conversation is also uh, an indicator of what we want out of this. We just don't want this to be a conversation. We want this to lead to tangible action. We want this to lead to a tangible impact on policy uh, into the way we relate to the police, to all the major security services. So my plea this morning is that enjoy this as much as possible. Uh, let's have a good conversation. Uh, if you are watching us, uh, thank you very much for joining us. You can follow us on all our social media platforms and keep an eye on this. So thank you once again and enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike OTJ and If you and the judges liked their last performances, then you are yet to be thrilled to more amazing performances this Sunday. This week, it's story time. <laughs> the gods of Tenzong are gods of peace and of unity. Brace yourself as the ladies narrate folklore from their regions, carefully crafted stories to captivate, educate, and entertain you. Join us this Sunday live on TV3 at 8 p.m. to keep your favorite contestant in the competition. Dial star 713 star 13 hash or download the TV3 reality app from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store and follow the prompts to vote. Studio audience is strictly by invitation. GMB 2021, rediscovering true beauty. GMB 2021 shows Sundays at 8 p.m. and repeats Fridays at 3 p.m. and is sponsored by Lavon's Tomato Mix, Camel now from Kerex, Freedom from Casa Precum, GTP, Darling Lemon Drink, Airtel Tigo's Big Time Bundles, Blue Fart, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, Heaven Black Mosquito Spray and Coil, and Napa Mackerel, Geisha, Close Up, Ayo Insurance. And supported by so I have a question for you. Do you masturbate? Is anybody here addicted to masturbation? They who says, but they know what they do when they're home. We're talking about that. There's a young man who's here to share his story of how he overcame his addiction to masturbation. Well, it all started 10 years ago. I lived with my uncle. So they had this guy with them in the house. So I was in the bathroom with him one day and he was doing it. Uh, 
So I confronted him, I was like, I should try it. So he put soap in my hand and then I started doing it. That instant? That instant. Okay. And then we have a young lady as well who's going to be telling us her story of how she battled lesbianism. How did you become a lesbian? Through a friend. Who's this friend? How? in SS1. We vacated and on our way home, we went to the hotel room and that was how everything started. She saw the hair on my stomach and I'm very hairy. Mm. So she was praising me okay. and I was thinking I was I was on top of the world. Mm. Then she started fondling me and she started fondling you. Yeah. The day show with Bella Mundi shows on Thursdays at 9 p.m. and repeats on Saturdays at 3 p.m. on TV3. Dubbed Examining Security in Ghana Options for Action. We are live on 3FM as well, as well as streaming live on 3news.com. Thank you very much for joining us. So let me just um, welcome some of our guests who have joined us today. I want to acknowledge Dr. Ishmael Norman, Dr. Norman, one of our security analysts as well, as well as Adib Sani, who is also with us here today. Richard Kumado, and then, of course, uh, Chief Superintendent Hamza Yakubu, former commander from police unit. Also welcoming uh, here with us Adam Bona. We also have some students from the UPSA Law School, as well as the Ghana Institute of Journalism. We are also welcoming alumni of the Kofi Annan uh, International Peacekeeping Training Center. And I want to welcome all of you for making time to be with us today. And I will now take a quick view, a wrap of all some of the security issues that have come up in the last two quarters, which will be relayed to us now. Barely a week passes without reports of a violent crime or another. In cases where the incidents are not violent, they have had to do with alleged suicide or even deaths resulting from other causes. The matter of a killing of an 11-year-old by two teens in Kaswa is still fresh on our minds. More than three months after that incident, only a month ago, an Uber driver was killed in gruesome circumstances at Feyase in the Shanti region. I had blood stains all over me. I then went to wash down. Residents are yet to recover from the July 4 incident. A few days earlier, on June 14, a broad-day bullion van attack at Adedinkbo in Accra left a police constable and a mother of three dead. The two have since been buried, but the families say they want justice. Our greatest concern is how to cater for the three children. After all is said and done, we need help. Families of the two are still awaiting a semblance of closure more than two months after the incident. But how about the security personnel themselves coming under fire? Only last week, August 2, 2021, a female police constable identified as Sandra A.J. was allegedly murdered in cold blood by her civilian boyfriend in Damongo in the West Gonja municipality of a northern region. A statement from the police said the suspect, who is currently at large, might have stabbed the victim with a knife. She was found in a pool of blood with wounds. The statement concluded the police is on the hunt for the boyfriend of a deceased. To the family of the late constable Sandra Esiedu, they have lost a loved one. And same for family of Lance Corporal Sarah A.J. of Nkoko Divisional Headquarters of the Ghana Police Service, who was found dead in a hotel room at Nkoko on August 8. Director General of Police CID has taken over the matter, but the hand for Sandra Isidu's killers is on. Two persons, including a boyfriend of a deceased police corporal, are in the grips of the police while investigations continue. 
manager of a hotel where she was found dead is also helping in investigations. While a hand is on for the whereabouts of a Hyundai Elantra last driven by the deceased. The latest streak of police deaths adds to a series of deaths of policemen, some alleged to be suicide early this year. Only last Monday, three suspected robbers were gunned down in what police says was a shootout. The three are reported to have trailed a businessman who had withdrawn some money from the bank at Opabia. The police quickly moved into control over the situation. They decided to shoot at the police and the police exchanged fire with them. On the cash transaction front, several mobile money vendors have been attacked, including one near Kofodria on June 19 this year. The Association of Mobile Money Vendors is terrified. Robbery attack recently has increased from January to June. Robbery attacks on mobile money agents has increased to 200, you know, individual mobile money attacks. In February, an ambulance service driver and a pregnant woman were also attacked during an emergency. We reported the case this morning at a Lukum police station and they promised us that they would do whatever they would do in their capacity arrest the perpetrators. On the back of these incidents and even more, there is apprehension among a section of the citizens today because whether in homes, on the streets or at workplaces, the criminals are on rampage and people are dreadfully thinking and asking who may be next. And uh, that was a wrap from my colleague Komla Adum there. Certainly there's so much more than that that has been reported publicly in the media and the police themselves are, are very much aware and have been dealing with some of these issues. We'll certainly hear from them. But at this point, let me introduce our guests for this uh, Thought Leadership Forum on examining security in Ghana, options for action. Uh, one of our guests is Professor Kofi Abuchi. He is the Dean of the UPSA Law School, served as the Secretary to the Ayawaso West Wagon Commission of Inquiry, He's a managing partner at Axis Legal, a firm of corporate solicitors and barristers. He also holds a PhD from the University of Milan, an LLM degree from the Harvard Law School, USA. And he's also, of course, an alumnus of the University of Ghana. Professor Abuchi, thank you for taking time to join us today. Please applause for him. Our second guest is Mr. Mutaru Mumuni Mukhtar. He is the executive director of the West Africa Center for Counterterrorism Extremism. He's a 2016 Mandela Washington Fellow, a global shaper of the World Economic Forum, and a scholar of the Aspen Institute. He holds an MA in International Terrorism, Global Crime, and International Security from Coventry University in the UK. Please welcome him. Also, we have with us as one of our speakers, programs uh, manager and team leader for the security sector governance, as well as local urban governance, CDD Ghana. And that's Paul Nanakwabna Abrampa Mensa. He manages CDD Ghana's desk on conflict and peace management. He managed Kodeo's projects on elections, uh, related violence and peace promotion programs, which he has done since 2008. He served as a technical advisor to the National Peace Council during the mediation process for the NDC and the NPP and other stakeholders to disband politically related vigilante groups. He holds an MPhil in political science from the University of Ghana. Please a round of applause for him as well. I'll be telling you a bit more about our other guests, but we have other guests who are, you know, distinguished themselves in their field of endeavor, and uh, we'll be bringing you those uh, details shortly. But just to let you know that security is really an important issue. It's an issue that touches everybody. It's a matter that when it comes to the crunch, sometimes you are alone and you are looking for all the people to help you, and sometimes you are really just alone. 
So let me uh, also introduce our other guests. And our other guest is ACP Kwesifori. He is the Acting Director General, Public Affairs Directorate of the Ghana Police Service. And um, ACP Kwesifori is an alumnus of the Kofi Annan uh, Institute for Peacekeeping Training. And he has an MA from there in Security uh, Affairs. He's also uh, an alumnus of the Ghana Institute of Journalism. He has a degree in public relations, and he's been head of operations for the Ghana Police Service. Let's welcome ACP Kwesifori. And also, let's welcome uh, Honorable Peter Tobu. He is the MP for Wa West and a member of the Defense and Interior Committee of Parliament. He had a long and illustrious career in the Ghana Police Service. He was Executive Secretary to the IGP. Let's welcome him as well. So those are our guests for today. We want to welcome you all. Thank you very much. Our first um, speaker is ACP Kwesifori. He is the head of the Public Affairs Directorate of the Ghana Police Service. Uh, like I said, served as head of operations for Accra Region and uh, has also uh, been in the police service for quite a long time, dealing with us a lot in the media. You're welcome. Good morning, Madam Hoos, colleagues, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. The Ghana Police Service, as we all know, has a constitutional mandate to protect life and property and enforce all laws and regulations in this country. That is general maintenance of law and order, among other things like detecting crime and prosecuting criminals on behalf of the AG department. Being a constitutional body, we have the police council, we have the inspector general of police who chairs the police management board and he is in charge, assisted by director generals at the headquarters, HR, operations, welfare, services, technical, ICT, among others, as well as public affairs. And beneath that, we have the regional commanders in the 16 political regions, and divisional commanders, district commanders, station officers, among others. And our task is to protect the good people of this country. Our task is to ensure that we need crime in the bad and to ensure holistic security throughout the breadth of this country. By that, we are challenged to do more, civil society as part us, to do more, and by so doing, we've devised strategies and programs across the country. We've increased our strength in police patrols, particularly in the operations department across the country, in conflict prone areas, criminal prone areas, i.e. robbery, violent crimes, and other extreme offenses. And our, men are, and our men and women are deployed throughout every 24 hours that we have. And I can say that crime, violent crime, have been with us from the colonial regime or even pre-colonial, colonial and post-independence era. But one thing we've seen is the changing trends, changing trends. And the police have a crab mapping section under the operations department, the CID, and other intelligence services. Police, we don't operate solo. The intelligence organizations like the 
Bureau of National Investigation, NIB, the Defense Intelligence, the National Security Apparatus, and the external intelligence under the foreign affairs. We coordinate and operate as partners in ensuring the security of this country, including the Ghana Armed Forces. So, of late, some of the media hypes does not necessarily depict that there is an increase in crime, but some of the crimes are so worrying and disturbing, i.e., what happened at Adedimpo? A woman just doing her normal job, being killed by ruthless men. It's very unfortunate. And our own colleague, the way of manner, this gentleman was killed, an engineer by profession. A constable who belongs to a family, belongs to a society belong to an institution. So when it comes, and of late, let us also not forget that we have over more than 300 media houses in, though not accurate, but more than from the ordinary man's perspective. And they will all hive these kind of stories. And at the end of it, you see people experiencing fear of crime. Even in their own environment, they are afraid when they go out. And that is why the public affairs unit, the community policing comes in to educate people on security needs, how to conduct themselves, how to live, you know, to avoid criminals among others. And we've been doing all these things for the common good of society. But the people's court the thinking of the people still persists. And what they expect from their police is to do more for them. And I can assure you that the present Inspector General of Police, the current Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Kufudampare, is so determined to take the police to another level. He's so determined that the police is going to win war against violent criminals like robbers, kidnappers, and others. And quickly, strategies are being put in place, effective strategies that will enlist public support, that people will see and own it and contribute to the development of good security in this country. Let us not forget that we have a symbiotic relationship with members of the public and security is a shared responsibility. The police will play its part actively and we expect members of the public also to do more to assist. Uh, we're going to see how we're going to cultivate, cultivate that relationship and aggressively the police administration is on top of affairs. Robbery in Accra, for instance, has reduced. We know other parts of the country, they are experiencing robbery, but I can tell you that a holistic strategy is to be rolled out. And we're going out in a very robust manner and will not miss our targets. We'll make sure that we work to the satisfaction of the taxpayer and the good people of this country. And we're looking at Langadism in Accra and its surrounding areas. It's now even moving into the eastern region, central, among others. And we are very grateful to the honorable members of parliament for passing that bill to address that law, to address Langad activities, hooliganism, among others. And this new law, is a tough one. And police, we've started applying, we are now applying those laws against people who have committed those kind of offenses. And regarding fraud, this internet and other 
related high crimes. So much has been done by the police, and that we've been able to win the war partially, leading or making us not to be blacklisted anymore. And we are working assiduously to make sure that we control that. We know the internet and other related crimes. Some are even committed outside the territories of this country. But with the help of experts from civil society, police, and other intelligence services, we are on top, and most of them also have been put before court. I know, interestingly, the, when you look at what I said earlier on, that the trend that we are concerned with, robbery, traditionally, robbery used to be in the night in Ghana. I mean, throughout, it's the night that people commit robbery. But of late, we seen daylight robbery. Some even don't even mark their faces. They come in in that bold manner, you know, to engage their targets. But the police, we've also restructured our training. The CTU, the SWAT teams, the Plaincroft operational units at the CID headquarters, Accra region and other regions are working closely to defeat them. And we've even infiltrated their ranks and we'll make sure that the good people of this country enjoy peace and security. But in a whole, in a holistic manner, the police service is better with you know, challenges from one region to the other. But in spite of all the cultural differences, socio-cultural differences, and differences in the way a manner people commit crimes, that is the modus. We have a DEX that have been looking at all this and we've harmonized our operations across the country. Uh, looking at small arms and other things due to the history of West Africa, the wars in some parts of West Africa allow small arms to float across the sub-region. A lot also have been done, a lot of seizures have been done by the customs, immigration service, the police itself, the intelligence services, and also with support from members of the public. So now I can say that in spite of the dangers in our sub-region, Ghana still enjoy peace. Ghana is still secured thanks to our security services from the armed forces, police, immigration, fire, and everybody, and the good people of this country. And it is our hope that we'll continue to put out better strategies, tougher measures operationally, and also to engage our communities effectively through community policing programs and other good governance programs. Thank you very much, uh, ACP Kwesi for a Please, a round of applause for him. And his topic was an overview of the current security situation in Ghana there. And he's indicated that every effort is being made to provide Ghanaians decent security. The training is being restructured to make it more modern, more up-to-date, to deal with the cr newer crimes of cybersecurity and all that. So thank you very much, ACP. Let's welcome our second speaker, who is the Honorable Peter Lanch Tobu, who is the MP for Wa West and member of the Defense and Interior Committee of Parliament. And his topic is reforming Ghana's security sector, Parliament's role. Thank you very much, Honorable Tobu. Thank you very much, um, the host. Uh, let me just stand on existing protocol. Good morning to you all. Today is a very important day. For the first time, I'm going to attend the program, and I never thought about any other team from home on the road till the program. But I'm just beginning to think about what is going to happen at the program. Because this sub-region is suffering from what we call terrorism, violent extremism. And as we sit today in this particular room, I'm sure if you are that security background, you begin to, to are you safe? You begin to imagine, are you safe in this room for the next two hours? How sure are you that you are safe? I came here very early because I wanted to be sure that we safe sitting here. So I did a lot before coming in here. So be rest assured that you are safe until you get out of here. Um, 
I must appreciate the organizers for this program. It is timely. The time couldn't have been better right than now. I will do a bit of background on the topic. I will give you some symptoms to show you that in Ghana, we really need to reform our security sector. I'll go straight away to talk about the role of parliament in this dream of reforming Ghana's security sector. And I will just do some brief conclusion on the matter. Um, security sector reform is generally defined as a process of transforming the security sector to strengthen accountability, effectiveness, and respect for human rights and the rule of law. It aims to enhance security sector governance through the effective and efficient delivery of security under conditions of democratic oversight and control. The need for reforms in Ghana's security sector is behind time. I say it is behind time because from 1957 to 1992, we've had the First Republic, the Second Republic, and the Third Republic, all summing up to about 15 years. The rest of the years in the 35-year period from 1957 to 1992, we were under military dictatorship. So 20 years of military dictatorship, and the longest was actually from 1981 to 1992, 11 years. And right after this military dictatorship, we moved straight into the Fourth Republic democracy. We adopted the 1992 constitution. And I've always said, moving from military rule to democratic rule requires some deliberate effort to reforming the security sector to be a power with democratic tenets. If you don't do that, and you carry a military mentality of policing, you carry a military mentality of an immigration officer, you carry a militarized brain into a democratic setting, you will, of course, be working very hard, doing the best that you can, but all of a sudden you realize that the citizen will not be impressed. They will not be impressed because you are not democratic enough. So Ghana's security sector reform is lacking behind time 28 years. We should have done this in 1992. But as I've been saying, ladies and gentlemen, better late than what? Never. We will try the best that we can to ensure that Ghana's security is put in shape. There is something that happened that I want to share with you. Some brief indicators that I want to show some symptoms for you to realize that it is time for us to reform. And that time actually had expired many years ago, but we have to do it now. When you find demonstrations being policed by lethal force, the police are going out there to provide security for demonstrators, enjoying their democratic right, their constitutional right. And they carry with them AK-47 rifle with live bullets. It tells you we need to do something about that. And it tells you the police is a need some kind of reforms to appreciate the fact that you don't go policing demonstration with lethal ammunition or lethal what, weapons. You don't go policing demonstration with intent to kill. Because you carry a weapon with live bullet, what is it for? You are supposed to use it. And if you are using it, what is it for? It is supposed to kill. Are you supposed to kill demonstrators? Of course, no. If you look at what is happening recently, anytime you see military br brutality in a democracy, it tells you there is something wrong. In my own constituency, a young man who is unemployed decided to be very innovative, established a car washing bay. The soldiers went there to wash their car, and that is where they've been washing their vehicle, of course. And the young man said, because of our relationship, we are here to provide security. Instead of you paying 15 cities per wash, I am going to give you a discount. So always pay 10 cities. The soldiers said, okay, no problem. Just wait a minute. We are coming. They took the car back to their barracks, dressed up in full military uniform, came back, picked the young man, took him to the barracks, and beat him to pulp. And the next question that came, if you see a military car next time, will you wash and collect money? The young man out of fear said, no, sir, I will not do that. If you see some of this, it tells you for... 28 good years in the Fourth Republic, we should be learning something new. This cannot happen in a democracy. What it means is that there is something still militarized in the head that says that you can enjoy impunity without being punished. But that is not true. The Parliamentary Select Committee on Defense and Interior is following that matter and we are working seriously. If you look at what happened in Nigeria, what happened in Nigeria is just a symptom of the challenges the security sector faces that requires reforms. Soldiers and police were both deployed. Who is in charge? Nobody can say. But all of a sudden, two people are dead. Who is being held responsible? Nobody can say. We have spent money, right, to form the Justice Commission Committee 
They've done the investigation, they submitted the report. Imagine the amount of money that we have spent on that particular matter. Because something unprofessional has happened. Something unprofessional has took place. There is a security gap, and that gap must be blended and covered over time. That is what we talk about reforms. If you watch the video recently from WA, when I saw it, I thought we were in Afghanistan or probably in Somalia. The first day I saw the video, I was like, no, what's up? Is that an old video? Probably during the days of military rule. They said, no, this was fresh. And it's not coming from anywhere. It's actually coming from your own background, your back door, your, your region. It was coming from what? The capital town of the Upper West region. And I said, is there a conflict? I thought that the people were misbehaving and the soldiers went down there to teach them a lesson, as we say. Show them a bit of discipline and let them conform to normalcy. No, it wasn't the people who were doing anything. The military just went in there to brutalize innocent civilians. And that was unacceptable. These are all signs to tell us that we need to do something about our security sector. A police officer is struggling inside a moving vehicle to snatch the vehicle key from the driver. The car is on the move. And the police officers in the car struggle with the driver to take off the key, all in an effort to enforce the law. When you see some of these things, it's quite embarrassing. It dents the image of the Ghana police service, but it goes to show that we need to do something new and something different and something quickly. Look at what is happening. You find a Ghana fire service officer, Ghana national fire service, that is fire. And the fire service officers are invited, or the Ghana national fire service is invited, and they arrive at the scene of fire without water. They arrive at the scene of fire in a taxi. If you see some of these signs, it tells you that there is a need for us to do some reforms in this country. When armed robbers or soldiers um, in the internal security space, when you find armed soldiers in the internal security space, the police are challenged, they are stretched beyond limit, they invite the army to come into support. But anytime you find that the army is staying on or in the internal security space for too long a time, there is a challenge. They are not supposed to take over internal security space. They are supposed to be the last backstop. They are they're supposed to be the last point in the security structure that when things get worse, we call on the army to step in. But if you find them with that all the time, it tells you there is a problem and we need to resolve that. There is something I want to share with you quickly before I go to parliamentary role. In 1974, the Ghana Police Force changed its name to the Ghana Police Service. It's just changed in nomenclature. But they missed the point. Moving from a force to the service, you're required to do some deliberate transformation of the minds of the police officer. He's a force man. And he said, today, he said, go and provide a service. You need a different brain to provide a service, and you need a different brain to enforce laws and to be able to be a force, a force man. So from force to service is a huge gap that requires some transformation. We did nothing about that. We enjoyed the nomenclature. And I think that in this country, we realize that nomenclatures are something we enjoy so much. We just change names but they don't mean anything. Ladies and gentlemen, after the coming into force of 1992 constitution, parliament in 1994 decided to enact the Public Order Act, Act 491 of 1994. Why? Because they felt that the freedom that were guaranteed under the constitution were so expressive and people were enjoying it, but they were enjoying it without realizing that they had responsibilities. So parliament passed that law to ensure that you have the freedom you have the right to enjoy your freedom, but you are also responsible for something. That law remained in the books and has been in the books from 1994 up to date. But you know what? It was only in 2014 that one inspector general of police, Mr. Mohammed Ahmed Al Hassan, came and realized that no, you cannot enforce this law using live bullets. And he went back to the police training school and converted the armor car squadron a relic of coup d'etat, a relic of military rule, he converted that to the form police unit and took them to Palugu, converted that school into a public order training school and trained them to become what? Public disorder management specialists. And that is why in Ejirahman we didn't see them there enough to be able to deal with that situation. It became an embarrassment. There is something we have to do as a country. Straight away to what parliament can do. Parliament in itself has three thematic areas to look at legislative power, oversight, and the last but not the least is representative. When you talk about legislation, we pass laws. Oh yes, parliament is passing the law. Are the laws working? We don't know. You pass the law and you sit back. What I expect parliament to be doing towards this new reform is that when you pass a law, 
please make sure that the implementation is apt. If the implementation is challenged and you think that it's because of the nature of the law, can we look at the law again? Laws must work in this country for our democracy to be meaningful. If we are passing laws and the laws are many and they are not working, the rule of law cannot be said to be working enough. So when you look at legislation, as, again, as I say, what laws are we actually passing? The law that grounds the Ghana Police Service, for instance, Act 350, 1970. I'm sure it's older than every police officer in the Ghana Police Service now. The law is even older than our, our constitution. Is that something we can do about that law? Because times have changed. The world is changing, and so must policing also change. The fundamental law, can it be tempered with? The fundamental law, can it be reviewed? Can we look at it properly? Let me move so probably to um, representation. Democracy is all about representation. We have 275 constituencies in Ghana. So if you are going into recruitment and you are saying that the police must be representative, the armed forces must be representative, and I am a, 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 an MP representing over 100,000 people in my constituency with over 53,000 voters, and you finish the recruitment and there is no single soldier from my constituency, how representative is that? You finish the recruitment and there is not a single police officer from my constituency, how representative is that? So in that representative spirit, we will pray that we should have structures in place to ensure that everything about security, as much as we agree that security is a collective responsibility, we should also collectively enjoy what is available before we come and suffer what the pain is. The last one on parliament is the fact that parliament has um, an oversight responsibility. The Defense and Interior Committee place oversight over the Minister of Interior, Minister of National Security, Minister of Defense, the NIB, and all that. All of that, we have to ensure that they do what is right. But what is so important for me, with my few days in Parliament, you go in there and realize that they brought the budget. We have to endorse the budget. And after endorsing the budget, who follows up? There was something I learned during the budget review. For instance, one million Ghana cities is approved for a particular organization or a particular agency. And Parliament approves it. At the end of the financial year, you got to realize that the report comes to say, in fact, actually 500,000 was released. So you approve a budget of one million for a particular security agency. The government actually goes to release only half of that. And you expect the security agency to perform to optimum. It doesn't happen anywhere. And even the one million that was approved, for instance, probably just about 30% of the total budget requirement of that particular institution. So the 30% is not even provided. At the end of the day, what is released is far, far less. If there is no money, how can security be effective? All right. So, Honorable Tobu, I would like to uh, end us on that for the moment. Thank you very much, Honorable Peter uh, Tobu, member of the Defense Committee in Parliament. Uh, so, we move on to our third speaker, who will be speaking on the topic in search of the law, practice and security for Ghanaians. Let's give a round of applause for Professor Kofi Abuchi, UPSC Law School Dean. Thank you. Thank you, Vernon, existing protocols, to also acknowledge everyone who's here. The law sometimes always appear to be in tension with issues of security. And the reason this appears to be the case is because the law seeks to protect conflicting or seemingly conflicting variables. The law wants to protect the rights and liberties of individuals. The law wants to ensure that security is a means by which the purposes of the law are achieved. I believe it was the famous American statesman and founding father, Benjamin Franklin, who said, anyone who wants to give up a little bit of his liberty for the sake of safety is neither worth the liberty nor the safety. But I think he was speaking at a time when America, having come out of civil wars and haven't, haven't you know, wrestled itself out of colonialism, Price liberty above all things. But even he will acknowledge that in the absence of security, in the absence of safety, liberty means nothing. The law therefore recognizes the need for us to assure everyone of safety, of security, 
for everyone to be able to also enjoy the liberty the constitution grants. So as you speak of the law, Article 12 onwards, Chapter 5 of the 92 Constitution provides elaborate provisions on human rights. Everybody has all kinds of rights. The right to liberty, the right to movement, the right to assembly, the right to health, among others. People have all kinds of rights that are enshrined in the Constitution. In the absence of security, and in this case, we are not talking national security per se, we are talking human security. In the absence of human security, the laws mean nothing. So the Constitution grants you the right to life, but your right to life means nothing if for one bullet you die. And that one bullet can fly from any direction. And it could be an unwanted visitor in your house in the middle of the night, or as has been said these days, right in the middle of the road in the afternoon, you're driving somewhere. It is therefore imperative that people have a sense of security. And I think that is the challenge the police faces today. I certainly do share and empathize with the ACP. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ACP. Yes. Just to be sure. Yes, with um, ACP Kosifori, who has certainly been doing this for quite a long time and been speaking on behalf of the police. I certainly sympathize with him because sometimes he has a difficult job. And the reason he has a difficult job is because the police service, and the Honorable MP has also mentioned that, has moved from an era of force to an era of service without actually moving fully. In some cases, it still remains a false institution. In many cases, he has been accused of brutalization of citizens. But in some cases, too, we have seen the police distinguish themselves by demonstrating proper civic policing. I'm very confident in the current IGP, whom I've had the privilege of knowing for the better part of 10 years, and whom, whose record at the level at which I know him I look forward to a transformed police institution and in whose capacity I have deep conviction in because I know quite closely. So I share your, your confidence in the new IGP and I look forward to it. And if the response of the police to what happened at Shiashi recently is an indicator of the IGP's announcement of a statement of intent, then I think we should all be confident and, and, and wait for the things that the ASP has mentioned in terms of the, what the police are about to roll out. Because the reality of policing, and the, sorry, the reality of security is that criminals gauge the system and they project and plan in accordance with the reaction of the system. If the system is loose, criminals are emboldened. And therefore, when, the, when they try and there is no response, they try harder and keep pushing the boundaries until, frankly, um, we all have, we, we lose it all. And so we've gotten to a point where we cannot wait any further for the provision of security and for the provision of policing, adequate for policing for the system. And I think too many things have been mentioned, both by the ASP, ACP himself and uh, the Honorable MP, about specific incidents of acts of insecurity, acts that sort of demoralizes and frightens all of us in terms of how secure we are in the system. We've all witnessed so many of them. And you hear of murders that are unresolved. Unresolved murders create the perception that further murders may happen and they may be unresolved and your own murder may happen and nobody will be held account to, uh, to account for that. It is therefore imperative that the police demonstrates a capacity and that is what brings me to the key problem of policing today which is the issue of capacity. The issue of capacity in light of the law has to do with the adequacy of the training. A policeman who doesn't have adequate training gets angry quickly. And the reason he gets angry quickly is because one, he doesn't understand the scope, and concept, uh, the, sc the scope of his work. And because he doesn't understand the scope of his work, it is easy for him to take his anger on you, thinking you are the one who's standing in his way as far as his work is concerned. So I've always asked two students, there's a part of the Constitution, Article 14, which requires that when a policeman is about to arrest you, he must inform you in a language you understand on the basis of the arrest. Now, remember, not a language the policeman understands, but a language you, the one being arrested, understands. That is one of the most difficult provisions of the Constitution, even for you know, people who are multilingual. 
So the policeman must tell you in a language you understand. If you understand English, so be it. If you don't understand English, you must find out what language you understand. And he must tell you in that language the fact that you have been arrested. Of course, no policeman comes and asks anybody, what language do you speak, before I effect or complete the arrest. And any attempt at resisting the arrest may result in you losing the front part of your tooth. The reason is this. The law says that any arrest which fails the test of arrest becomes kidnapping. You mentioned 1974 when Ghana converted. In 1974, a funny incident also happened involving the police, in which a policeman failed to arrest somebody properly. And uh, the resulting chaos, um, you know, ended up in the policeman and the one being arrested, uh, ending up in a brawl and fighting. Um, the, the brawl resulted in the policeman being beaten. His um, uniform was messed up with. His barrels was messed up with. The court decided, when the matter came to court, the court decided that the person who was being arrested and which arrest was improper had the right to fight back. Because when an arrest process fails, any forcible taking of a person becomes kidnapping or abduction. That person has the right to fight back because at that stage, the police has no right to arrest or to, to forcibly take the person into custody, so to speak. The person was, however, convicted for touching, for beating and you know, for touching the uniform. In other words, the uniform of the police officer is not a personal property. It is an asset of the state. Therefore, if you touch the police officer, even more especially his barrel, which contains the insignia, you've committed a serious crime of state. So I jokingly tell my students, if you want to beat the police officer, make sure you're undressing first. Because uh, any, if you touch the body while he's in the uniform, you're in trouble. But it tells us one fundamental thing. Training and capacity is important. Today's criminality, I've been told I have four minutes, so I'm going to run up quickly. Today's criminality borders fundamentally on complexity. If you do not have forensic capacity, you have a problem. So as we speak about detection of crime, in the absence of forensic capacity, in which poli the police can indulge in trace evidence and be able to properly link crimes that happen where there's nobody, and in respect of which the deceased likely cannot speak for himself because he's dead, and for which we have no way of checking and connecting who actually committed this, there must be forensic capacity, and the police must have the adequacy of logistics in order to be able to do this. And ask the police, how adequate are your logistics? Crimes happen, and before the police get there, or, by the, or the police are even there, and the whole crime scene is messed up. Because people are walking on the crime scene, and the police are having a hard time keeping people off the crime scene. How many police stations in Ghana have tape, the tape, um, the, the tape the police normally barricade the crime scene with and write police line, do not cross? How many police stations in Ghana have that? How many police stations in Ghana have fingerprinting equipment? In other words, when they bring someone to the police station, the first thing, how many police stations have that basic uh, equipment or that basic whatever it is to take the fingerprint of a suspect so that even if that suspect runs the next day, they'll still be able to trace him somehow and get him once they are, he's arrested somewhere. How many police stations in Ghana are connected or synchronized by way of a single source database? So that if a police, uh, if, 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 if a criminal, sorry, is arrested at war, for example, but he's also wanted in Accra, he's arrested in war for stealing, and he's also wanted in Accra for murder, for example. How do we know that the person who's been arrested in uh, war for stealing is the same person in Accra who's also wanted for murder if there is no single database by which one entry would result in things popping up on the screen? There are certain basic things that, frankly, do not cost an awful lot of money, but which we still think the police can do better with if they are adequately resourced. So because of the time, and I do not want to be flagged by way of paper, um, I would just want to end it here by saying, in terms of the law, the police can never do their work in the absence of capacity, in the absence of resourcing, and of course, in the absence of addressing certain other systemic issues, which unfortunately, there's not much time to discuss at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Aboche. And I'm sure that the other issues can be raised when we do uh, question time, which is some uh, 20 minutes. So we'll now take our other speakers. Our speakers have 10 minutes and uh, three more speakers. So let's welcome um, Mr. PNK Abrampa Mens, giving us a talk on civil military relations. Are we eroding the gains? Um, PNK Abrampa Mensa, thank you very much. Uh, you need a mic. Hold on.
thank you very much, Jiva. <laughs> and uh, let me say a very good morning to all of us, including my co panelists. Uh, my work is a bit difficult. Civil military relations, are we eroding the gains? I don't know whether we are eroding or increasing it. But let me say. D and he's talking on civil military relations. Are we eroding the gains? Right, as uh, Honorable said, I shouldn't say it's decreasing, otherwise, the lights will go off again. So I will say it's increasing. And uh, let me start with the data uh, the Afro Barometer Survey of 2019 uh, to also prove that, yes, the trust level uh, of the military is not decreasing uh, and it's not also go improving. Uh, so, out of the 13 institutions surveyed in 2019, the military is still in the lead. It has 73% trust level, as against the police service that has 39% trust level. And even the parliament uh, was below the military. So, we can say the trust level and the gains that we've made in the trust in the military is not decreasing. Uh, however, I'm worried because the trust level seems to be dipping gradually. Uh, when you take the trend analysis of the Afrobarometer survey from 2005 to 2019, it rose up to 75%, and in 2019, it came down to 73%. The worst year for the military trust was 2014, when we recorded 57%. And we all know what happened between the civil uh, military involvement in some of the atrocities in the country in uh, 2014. So I'll come there as to the question asked me to try to answer whether we need a military in inland security. But let me first start by saying that the analysis of civil military relations is sometimes skewed. It's narrow. It's narrow to the extent that people analyze civil military relations to mean the armed forces involvement in civilian affairs in law enforcement, restricting the analysis and focusing it only in the involvement of support the armed forces give to the police service in law enforcement. However, you and I are aware that civil military relations go beyond that. Uh, in a constitutional democracy, there's official constitutional creation relationship between the civil, civil, uh, civil government and the military through the law, as any other constitutional creation. So there's a relationship per the law between the military or armed forces and the governments. And that's why the military should go by the police, uh, the, the, the civil government policies to guide its operations and actions. On the other hand, by the mandate of the military and the functions, the military is also expected to play a role in inland security. And it's not only the enforcement of law and order. The military plays other rules um, in, in preparing for this uh, thing and other presentations that I made. You realize that the military has been contributing to disaster management in the country. The military has been contributing to infrastructure development in the country, and in fact, there is a road in Sashi, there's a road in Afram Plains, feeder roads that were solely constructed by the military. So, and the, in times of um, disaster, we see the military contribution to the NATMO and in solving some of the disaster problems that we have. When we come to health services, we have the 37 military hospital here. There's a mighty project that military is constructing in my constituency in Karie, the Afari military project. So the military relations should not be subsumed to only law enforcement in the country as far as civil military relations is concerned. And, and it's reflects in the topic that I was given to deal with. So assuming it to uh, whether the military is in, uh, needed in inland security or support for inland security. Let me say that in a democracy, the military is a constitutional creation as an institution. And like any other constitutional creation institution, it is under the control of the government. And therefore, there's that constitutional relationship that should exist. The military pay, what I've also said, is also definitely needed to support inland security. In fact, it has more prudence, it's more prudence now than ever what happened in the US in 201, the popular 9-11. I don't think the US military strategy now will be the same as it was before 201. I don't also think the Burkina Faso military strategy now will be the same as it was in 2015 before uh, terrorism engulfed the country. What I want to express here is that a particular military strategy or a security strategy that will be fashioned for a country would be dependent on the dynamics of the security situation in that country or even around the world. In modern security terms, 
and after the end of the Cold War, nations' attention for external uh, uh, security has reduced. And because of extremist inland actions, more and more attention is being fashioned for internal security. And therefore, no matter what we do, the military will be needed to support internal security. But the question is the balance. At what stage do we need the military to be involved in internal security based on whose intelligence, who leads the deployments, and who controls the field action? We have been talking about two issues here. We have a service and we have a force. Before a military is deployed to a situation or a center or to quell any, any, any issue, it means the situation has gotten out of hand. The military is not trained to control as the service people will do. The military is trained to use the force to attract attention. So you deploying the military, the forces to be combined with the services in a certain situation, you are telling us that the service is there to quell it based on their own usual attention of demanding uh, a response from the people, whilst the military is there to enf enforce the law if the soft attention demanded is not conformed to. So by deploying the military, we are expecting a certain harsh action to be taken. That is the baseline. Let me also say that the might of a state is sometimes measured by the might of its security. The trust level of the institution of armed forces goes a long way to determine whether the people will support the actions of the military or not. There was a survey in the US um, after servicemen who have fought in external operations have come back. And the survey was conducted to assess how they were received uh, in the society. The perception was that people 100% accept the people because they are, they are warriors. They are the people who have fought to uh, put American interests in the limelight. However, the person went ahead to ask whether they really understand the work of the military. And about 50% of them do not even understand what the military does. But because the military has fought outside and put the flag high, they trusted the military. That's it. So the trust level of an institution will determine whether the people will accept them or not. That goes to say that the actions of the military and the deployment structure of the military to internal security we we'll also go a long way to determine whether people will support the actions of the military or not. So the question is to seek the balance as to what is the level of control that we should have on the military, who leads the deployment of the military, based on what intelligence. I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to use practical example to explain this, based on what uh, Honorable just uh, used as analysis at Ejirah Sechi Dumase, and I did follow uh, the committee's sitting. Uh, the minister was asked who deployed, called for action of the military, and he said he did. He did because he got uh, a, a message that the situation was got, uh, getting out of hands, and therefore there was the need for us to deploy the military there. Then the first question that came to mind that, so the intelligence upon which the deployment was done was just a phone call from somebody who is not an intelligent person, and it did not come from the military intelligence itself and therefore the, the deployment was done. It might also happen that it was because of that that there was a mere inaction on the part of responsibility of the people who were deployed that place. Because if a civilian should deploy a military person without proper deployment guidelines, you are not expected to see any favorable action from the military. And it is said by Simon Williams that in order for the military to be accepted in the state, even though it's a pivotal public service, it should be engaged by a civil organization that supports the military deployment, but has the intelligence from the military quarters itself. Yes, we will, we will need the deployment of the military to come and quell certain actions, but that deployment must come from the intelligence of the military itself. And he said, there's always a bad civil military relations when the military dominates internal security. There is always a bad civil military relations when the military dominates internal security. We are in a crossroad. So what do we do as a country? Yes, we accept the security challenges in the country. We accept 
uh, we, we have so many extremist actions going on. We have so many uh, daylight robbery going on. We are also saying, on the other hand, that when we have more and more actions of the military in inland security, it's, it, it's, it, it's uh, kind of possess a bad civil military relations. What should be the crossroad? I wouldn't like to answer this question. When we come to the interactions, I believe some of us here will come to the question. But we need to have a point, and the point I'm, I'm trying to end is that one, civil military relations go beyond the military's involvement in internal security. The military provides other services. That is not only law enforcement. Two, we need the military in internal security to support the police service. But as to what is the definition of the critical moment that the military should be called upon, is what the question that we should answer now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. PNK uh, Abrampa Mensa. Much appreciated for that. And certainly we'll come back to some issues there. Our final speaker will be speaking on preventing and combating violent extremism, the recruitment and radicalization of the Ghanaian youth. And uh, we welcome Mr. Motaro Mumuni Mukta, Executive Director, West Africa Center for Counter Extremism. Many thanks, sir, and uh, you have 10 minutes. Good morning to everyone, and good morning to my co-panelists. And yes, I'll stand on existing protocols, like those before me, say good morning to everyone. Yes, Ghana is still regarded as a peaceful country. It's the most stable politically in the sub-region, a region characterized by you know, violence, extremist violence in the last 12, 13 years. We have been ranked as the most peaceful country in West Africa, I mean in Africa, and second in West Africa. But to stop there is to ignore the growing serious challenges of insecurity that we are currently battling with. As the previous speakers have mentioned, have acknowledged in their presentations. And as we speak now, we are ambushed in the south by maritime piracy. That is actually at an all-time high. Maritime piracy has descended from the you know, Horn of Africa that a decade ago was a big menace. It has descended down towards the coast of you know, the Gulf of Guinea. And for a fact, in the first half of this year, you know, piracy attacks the region recorded the highest globally. And we're ambushed in the north by the onslaught of violent extremism. Violent extremism is descending towards coastal states from the Sahel, from Mali, in Niger, Chad now is very, very pervasive in Burkina Faso. Five years ago, we didn't have what we were having in Burkina Faso happening and several other developments within the region, especially close to our borders, have led many to conclude that we are actually sitting on a time bomb and that we've become more vulnerable to violent extremism than ever. Specific to Ghana, before August 2015, the idea of terrorism happening here on our space was a very, very remote possibility in the psyche of the Ghanaian population. We didn't have it featured in mainstream media discussions about the likelihood that there will be terrorist attacks here or we would suffer it in any form. Unfortunately, in August 2015, a young guy who left here, a product of KNUST, left home to join ISIS and sent a message back to his parents acknowledging his new affiliation and his new course. That is when it alarmed the Ghanaian public about the reality that this could be happening here, the vulnerabilities could be existing here, or vulnerable young people could be attracted to these ideals coming from elsewhere. And by the beginning of the year, 2016, actually we understood that he was, you know, he was killed in Syria. In the middle of the year, we had some arrests made in some parts of northern Ghana. You know, people who were engaged in terrorist training or videos in some bush on, in a place called Jantong Jabashi in the north. We had several other incidents that made us appear to be vulnerable to violent extremism. We had, you know, the Gitmo 2 came in here, provoked quite a lot of discussion here, and many 
described that as you know, a situation that also made us you know, susceptible to these ideals in here. We had the beginning of 2018, you know, arrests made here, here in Accra. Three young men, of course, invo involving one older person with handheld grenades. And one of them was believed to have come, um, had had some experience in the insurgency in Libya and Mali. Before the end of 2018, our organization, the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism, had encountered at least 22 individuals who were vulnerable to radicalization, who were having contacts with the extremist groups. And by the beginning of the following year, we had stopped 23 individuals from leaving to join ISIS. Uh, what are the details? Uh, of course, it's not everything I could say here. But uh, one very striking situation that we often cite is a young guy who was radicalized over time, largely on cyberspace, he recruited to join ISIS. And just the day before he was meant to depart to Syria through Agadez, Burkina Faso, and Agadez, he watched a program on preventing radicalization and violent extremism here in Ghana on local television. And I'm happy to say it was on T3, a program he used to have called ICRA. And that was what made the difference. He declined to go. He searched for us, eventually we got in touch with him, and we discovered astonishing stuff, the things he was involved in, and it alarmed all of us, those of us working in this space, that previously we didn't think that this was the extent of the threat we were dealing with in this space. So generally, uh, this is a reality here, and it's a reality within, in terms of the vulnerabilities that could lead individuals to engage in violent extremism. It is a reality externally, because we're seeing the region increasingly involved in this. And all the analysis point to the fact that the threat is descending to coastal states. Uh, what are the vulnerabilities? What are the drivers? We are looking at the issues of pervasive youth unemployment. Youth unemployment is the single biggest factor in many parts of the region. And in many ways, people describe what is happening in Mali, Chad, and Niger, Burkina Faso as a product of you know, the frustration of young people who have lost faith in their leaders' capacity to provide them with what we call the entitlements of citizenship. And so they're looking to other options. And, you know, Janine and other, other terrorist groups are providing that, a void left by the state. They are giving people $300, $500, a motorbike, and a gun. And it's a great cause for them. And so these things, largely, is a product of that situation. We're looking at pervasive issues of conflict. We have each chieftaincy and ethnic conflict as a single biggest source of insecurity here, you know, in the last, say, 30 years, it has been the biggest source of fatalities in this country. And we have uh, a report that just came out, you know, by the Global Terrorism Index, by the Institute of Economic, you know, Economic and Peace. And it pointed to the fact that 73% of terrorist fatalities during the year 2019 uh, came from countries that were experiencing conflicts. And so conflict is one of the single biggest drivers now. At the time, we experienced a peak in terrorist violence in West Africa in about 2014. We have 7,200 fatalities. It didn't come from countries that were experiencing conflicts. It came from you know, where the ideology that motivated young people to engage in were very right. So you see a changing dynamic, the fluidity of terrorism in dealing you know, with, the, with the region. And so we need to look out for things like that. We have issues of marginalization here, and we have several other security factors. And I know I've got two minutes. Several security factors that make young people very vulnerable. And we're seeing a change in the security profile of this country. Whilst we continue to proudly say we're a stable, peaceful country, the security dynamics and profile of Ghana has changed significantly. We're seeing, and I, I acknowledge, you know, ACP talking about the fact that, look, daylight robberies are now more prominent than before in Hollywood style, involving prominent people. We're seeing things relating to kidnapping. Kidnapping that hit us through were not a common feature here. They are happening involving high profile individuals. We're seeing pervasive involvement of young people in cyberspace. There's a huge illicit economy going on on the cyberspace, and we are unable to do anything about it. If we crack the people on cyberspace, the crime will move to you know, on space here, and we will see it manifest in very, very dreadful forms. And so we need to look at it Collectively, because all these things in combination, they lead young people, drive them towards radicalization. And radicalization is the single biggest factor that leads young people and any other demography.
to engage in terrorism. And hopefully we'll discuss more during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mukhtar Mumuni. Thank you very much. And at this point, let's have a big round of our applause for our speakers. And uh, the program is our Thought Leadership Forum here on TV3 and 3FM. It's also live on 3news.com. You can also send your message to our hashtag, hashtag TV3 Security Forum. And it's about examining security in Ghana, options for action. And at this point, I would like to uh, open the floor and I'll start with our distinguished uh, security analysts who are here with us. Uh, let's talk about what the options are for action. We've talked about what the state of security is and the police says they are making every effort uh, to roll out a new strategy that is on ground and really in touch with people in a bid to provide them decent security. There's the reform agenda being pushed by parliament. We all know that recently a new national security uh, strategy document was announced and I think it's all part of a certain process in achieving that. And then there's also what's the relationship between the law and security and that's where some of us as individuals sometimes get into trouble with the police because when they hold you and you try and tell them well I, I know my rights I want this I demand this uh, that may rather be your death knell and there's also military civilian relations and it's interesting that CDD's Afrobarometer survey continues to point to the military as having the highest level of trust because during the era of the Galamse fight, one of the things some people said was, why not let the security take custody of these excavating machines because other people were not trustworthy enough to manage that. But uh, these are all issues, of course, of law as well. And then, of course, there's a bit about violent extremism and what the drivers are, youth unemployment. And that's one of the key things mentioned in our new national security document as well, including uh, the kind of conflicts we see across our borders, not just in West Africa, but even going right up into the Sahel. And so these are some of the issues I'd like to uh, start off with. So at this point, uh, I don't know, I don't know who, which of the four want to start. Uh, it, Dr. Ishmael Norman, uh, Adam Bona, um, Richard Kumado, uh, Adib Sani. Okay, so we'll start with um, Mr. Adam Bona, who is the CEO of uh, Securities Warehouse. Uh, good morning, sir, and uh, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to uh, ACP Chris Fouri. I go back with him maybe 20 years ago. Uh, it's good he's moved from uh, operations to PR. And I hope that in, by the next program, he will be dressed like uh, a service provider. He's dressed uh, combat ready. And so I want to see him mimicking a service provider. This is how it starts, isn't it? So, ACP. Uh, I know you just moved, so. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm told from here. He's, he's, he's used to charge, charge. So, I think now he has to engage more of us. Yes, but uh, I must say, from my own perspective, I would want to look at the issue uh, we are discuss discussing uh, from a four-dimensional view. And, and one of it, which probably would be the media, has to do with the executive, and then uh, part of it has to do with the security agencies themselves and civilians. And I think uh, just before you ask the rest of us here to talk, you spoke about the national security policy document. Some of us for many years advocated to have a national a comprehensive national security policy document. Uh, yes, I would say it is work in progress. What we haven't done, which I think I would want to see all of us, the executive, the media, civilians, and all of us who are concerned about security, is to start looking at monetizing security. We haven't monetized it. When I say monetizing, I lived in Britain for a while. I used to like to speed as a young man. And at every given point when I went through the speeding you know, equipment, I got a ticket. There was a time I got about eight. And each of them, one day, and each of them I was supposed to pay many years ago about 80 pounds. 
per, per, you know, per traffic offense. And anyone who is listening understands who the traffic police officer is in Britain. They, they don't take anything, no. Once they arrest you, they've arrested you. We haven't done that. So people litter, you have people committing crimes, and what we see police officers collecting two cities. You have police officers sometimes collecting two cities, five cities, and all that. So I am saying that let's make committing crime very expensive for those who would want to commit crime, including traffic offenses. If we can do that, then the issue of lack of funds, because all this we are talking about, if you go to Kenforiata, the Honorable Minister, the Exchequer, you tell him you want money, he'll be thinking about uh, planting for food and jobs. He'll be thinking about education. He'll be thinking about the rest. But as we speak, there is no itemized tax for security. Nobody's talking about it. So you go to him, he tells you, show me where the money is. So please, I would want to see the national security policy document. Somewhere they said they are now going to look for money. No, the money is with the, you know, the offenders. Catch them, find them on the spot. But if you, I mean, please, if you give me one minute, I'll wrap up. If I break the law, the traffic offense, and a police officer arrests me, he says, let's go. He takes me there, and the, after a week, the judge would ask me to pay 600. I'll pay 100 cities to the police officer and walk away. But if the police officer had a tablet that says I should pay 100 Ghana cities, and out of that 100 Ghana cities, that police officer is giving 10% end of the year, depending on how many people he was here accosted. I think that we would be taking the burden of government in terms of providing security from counter-terrorism, from the street robberies, and in recruiting a lot more people too. So for me, I'm looking at it from the issue of funding. So let's get that right. If we get it right, I believe that uh, the mess we find ourselves will move away from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bona. I'll come back to you, I'll come to you Mr. Adib Sani, but I just want to take just brief response either from Honorable Tobu or ACP, because I remember there was legislation being introduced for fines, and one of the things mentioned was that the person receiving the fine should not be below the rank of a chief inspector, if I recall, but it was never really implemented. Uh, ACP, can you enlighten us a bit on that? I think um, the, that law has not been implemented. And I think as it will become a subject for discussion, police will wish it is implemented. And having security experts and leaders who have interest in seeing to security reform in all aspects in, and in all areas, I think we should consider that. That will be a revenue boost, you know, to the state, not the police. And we'll make sure that we go by that. But regarding the services that you say, saying, police has done a lot in the area of democratic policing. The recruits, the officers that will turn out, their mindset have been shifted. There is that new paradigm of service to our people. But one thing is regarding the uniform. We should not forget that the kind of crime that we witness in the police, yeah, they might be a blend, several that kind of operational uniform, you know, office wear, and that we have different kinds of wear. And I can assure you that that does not corrupt our mind or shift us to the arena of brutality and violence against the civil populace. We are very supportive to the democratic structures, the new system of governance, and everything we are supportive. And the one thing I would like Ghanaians to take note 
a sense the civil war in some of the West African countries where we experience light weapons, you know, flying across. The police also have that power to deal with people who handle illegal weapons that have been crafted to cause harm and death to decent people in society. And we are constitutionally backed with legal weapons. And we must make sure that such characters are subdued. We know recently our boys arrested a robber. A single parent, because she closed a bit late, cannot go home and cook for the children, decided to buy fried rice and some chicken, you know, for the children. Not, and he entered a banking hall to see a friend. So the moment he came out, a gentleman just clothed her down, took possession of the pack, and our boys were then on the street. They gave him a horses, and lo and behold, it is not money that the woman went in for. It's fried rice and chicken. You see, so such a guy was having a dagger, you know, by him, and wanted even to stab the officer, but they quickly nip him in the butt. And one thing is the training that we're talking of, even in the Western world, they put you in that sort of hard training, like what we're doing at Umunya concentration, police concentration camp in the Eastern region, where the policeman is trained and he is fit okay. for all kinds of uh, to to oh, deal. Thank, thank you very much, Chris. If I have to stop you there because we need to hear from the analysts, and I'll come back to you, Honourable Tobu. Just give me. Let me just let the analysts come through, and then I'll come back to you. So, uh, Mr. Sunny, you can go ahead quickly with your point. Sorry, you just have about two minutes. Yes. Well, um, I am first of all intrigued by the efforts of the military. So if the military can build all these bridges and construct these rules, why don't we save the taxpayers some money and give them the contracts? I mean, when you go to countries like Egypt, the, the military does a lot of these things and, and it saves the taxpayers some money. Okay, so the problem with the security governance of Ghana is our seeming over-reliance on traditional security against the most important aspect of security, which is human security, which my brother Mutar uh, touched. You see, on one aspect, traditional security can be very important. I mean, uh, working towards improving situational security awareness, like Prof has indicated, we should have the systems, the biometrics, the DNA uh, 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 databases, etc. In the US, crimes that were committed in the 70s and 80s where DNA didn't exist, Today, it's used to unravel the mysteries behind those crimes, like the case of the Golden State Killer, who killed and raped, you know, he raped and killed women in the late 70s and 80s. And he was recently arrested using a DNA uh, uh, technology called genealogy. So we really need to work towards improving situational crime prevention. But most importantly, and I say this without missing words, the greatest threats to the security of Ghana. It's not terrorism, it is youth unemployment. And it's in the best interest of government to listen to the youth so we don't in the future have a case of us biting our fingers and asking ourselves where we went wrong. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deep Sunny, who is a foreign policy and security analyst. Let's also welcome some thoughts from Dr. Ishmael Norman, Executive Director of the Institute for Security, Disaster, and Emergency Studies. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Sifa. Um, I will take it from where I did ended, that in fact in 2005, uh, the UNDP assisted a lot of the English-speaking countries in West Africa to draft anti-terrorism laws anti-money laundering laws, and the governments have systematically used those laws to intimidate and also take away the liberties of the people. Terrorism is a very important existential threat, but like he said, it is not the greatest threat to Ghana. 
I will then move on to the police. We've seen a lot of violence against police women. There are about 11,000 police women in the entire police force of about 39, maybe 40,000. And out of this number, or is it about 29,000? 29,000. Out of this number, we've seen quite a few of them being killed recently. I think the new IGP would do well, would do well for this country to stop. There's too much fraternization. Senior officers chasing younger women and creating all kinds of confusion within the force. That has to stop. It can be stopped with threat of punishment and demotion in rank. This is all I'm going to say because I think we can put a stop to this. We can also assist the younger women in the police force. There are not that many. Every three police officers, only one is a woman. Yet the women in this country are 52% of the population. There should be more women in the police force. But whatever it is, this is the situation. I think the IGP can do well to improve the lives of women in the police force as part of police reforms, according to Honorable Pete Tabo. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Norman. So let me just take a quick point uh, from Honorable Tobu, who wanted to make a quick point. Then I'll come to the audience. Any thoughts from the audience so that I can just pick one, two? Okay, so one. Okay, two. Then I'll come back. All right. Thank you very much, um, Jeffa. Dr. Norman, I think that what you've raised now is an issue that is of old, that in the past a senior police officer cannot have a relationship with a junior rank. It was not allowed for you to even marry one. If you marry one, then the lady will have to resign from the service. All of a sudden, it has died down, and that is why the confusion is coming. There was something about automation of um, road traffic systems in Ghana. And I'm surprised after now it has not hit the road. The law is there, but we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the system to, to operationalize the law. And I think there was an organization that came to partner with the Ghana Police Service to ensure that this happened. Of late, I've realized that it's not coming up, and I think that, that that arrangement is dead and gone. The new IGP will have to look at it again. I think it's the way to go. And we can generate a lot of income using the automated system, because technology must be accelerated to make more money. All right. Thank you very much, Honorable Tobu. So I'll uh, come to the crowd now. I think you were to give us our first point, and then you are second, and then I'll pick the next two. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Michael. Thank you so much. I'm Bassett, an alumni of Korea IPTC. Um, my senior colleague, Adib, took some useful words out of me. But then uh, the straightforward question I would like to ask our distinguished panelists and all of us seated here is, in all these discussions, where do we factor in political will or commitment of government in implementing these useful discussions, as well as this strategic uh, vision of purpose we have for our security governance in this country. Because Honorable Tobo made a very striking uh, point in the course of his presentation, that laws must work in this country for our democracy to triumph. If we are having all these discussions, at the end of it all, we come up with those useful policies. ACP was talking about, you know, our cause for action, amongst many other you know, policies in the offering, of which, okay. in his view, he believed would strengthen the operational capacity of the Ghana Police Service. In all those things, where do we put political will? Okay, thank, thank you, you very you. much. Uh, let's take a second point. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. And good morning to everybody. And let me comment, our panelists. I am Sami Nu Mustafa, popularly known as Ku Sami local government advocate. Okay. I think I have, I have come with a diagram to demonstrate something to our speakers and all of us here to see. Uh, I think, so this is how our governance system is being structured. If you look at the diagram, if you look at the bottom, if you look at the bottom, that's where the unit committee are. And that's where we should be gathering data. And if we say we are gathering uh, intelligence, that's where the intelligence gathering should start from. 
Because this, it fits the structure here from bottom to the Regional Coordination Council. And I think that part has been cut up in our governance system. If you ask our MPs, if you ask the security, I have not seen any time that they have anything doing with that important structure as the, the, that described in this, in this country. And since at this time, we make sure our MPs, our security men, they have something doing with this structure that's um, demonstrated. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mustafa. So I'll take the lady in the yellow jacket who raised her hand, and then I'll take no, the gentleman at the back then. Let's come back and then if we have time, we can take that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the question should be straight to the point, please. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. So my question is to Professor... Your name, please. Sorry. My name is Nanaba okay. from Paul, and I'm a regulator and financial crime professional. Okay. Uh, I'm based in the UK. Now, mm -hmm. my question is to Professor Abuchi. You spoke of capacity and you spoke of educating your staff. Do you think there's a way that we can educate people from a young age, maybe have a citizenship course, so that way when we have people in the force, they already have the mindset and it's not, it's not the time for people to start teaching them what it means to be a good civil servant. And we as citizens are also aware of what our rights are and we can uh, express ourselves without being in any danger. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Desmond Tete, and I'm a final year student of the Ghana Institute of Journalism. I have three questions, and they are We can only to... take one, I beg your pardon. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so my question is directed to Professor Abramfa. Sir, please, you made um, a final statement, and I quote, harsh actions need to be taken when the military is deployed. And um, on January 7th, beginning of this year, uh, in the parliamentary proceedings before the a speaker was chosen. We saw the military uh, evading uh, or trooping in, into the parli uh, parliament. So my question is, can you kindly define what you meant by harsh statement, please? All Thank right. You. Thank you very much. So uh, you can give him the mic. We'll try and come back if we can. So I think there's a question for Mr. Ab Professor Abochi, one for you, um, ACP, one for you, um, Mr. Abrampa Mensah. So I'll start with you, Mr. Abrampa Mensah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, that has a question as to what is the definition for critical moment for which the military is called upon to enforce security. Uh, in fact, one of the policy briefs that I, I authored, I did say that Ghana could have uh, a middle structure, just like we have in some French-speaking countries that we have the gendarme. Uh, that's in, in when the normal security face challenges, in order to climb up to the military, they use the gendarme to come and support the internal security operations. The issue of always deploying our military to support any mere uh, law enforcement is becoming too much, and that's what Lindsay was saying, that it seeks to deteriorate the trust level of the military. And the, the way the military is trained, they are not trained for such purposes. The military, as we call that, they are not service, they are forces. And any time they, they are called upon in any situation, they have come there because the situation as it is has gotten out of hands. And therefore, they need to come and apply force to get it to normalcy. So the military is not expected. That's why I laid out some of the issues, uh, uh, avenues, they are, they, their services are used in the country, not only in law enforcement. So we need to have a, a substructure. And I believe we already have uh, the rapid deployment force. We have the Buffalo units. We have some structures within the police that we can strengthen to take up some of the key issues that we call military to do, the military will only have to take part in internal security. That, I mean, has got into a stake that nothing could be done about that. So that's what I mean about harsh actions when the military is called upon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abrampa. Yes, Professor Abuchi. Um, that's a good question you asked. I think we can all do with a little bit more civic education. Let's be honest. I think civic education in our national life appears to be all but dead. And there are a lot of young people who have no clue anything about civic education. The Constitution has a whole section, a whole article, Article 41, dedicated to national duty. That is the duty and responsibilities of citizens. Few people know anything about that. Students at the secondary school level, I haven't checked, but 
the last time I ever had this conversation, my impression is that it's, the content is very minimal. And it's part of the reason why our sense of nationalism is dying. Because few people have a sense of attachment to Ghana. They haven't read anything about Ghana. I think we've gotten to a point where it may make sense that even at the university level, everybody should read basic civic education as part of its course. Formerly at the University of Ghana, there's a program called the African Studies, yes. which was compulsory for every student. I think something like that. A mandatory course, say in first year, where every student, regardless of the course you're reading, whether you're a medical student or you're a law student or you're an agricultural science student, you read some course in civic education. And if you allow me, I know you've taken your microphone, so 30 seconds. Um, you know, and about the police. When it comes to civic education, let's be honest. I think we have to be, we have to be honest to say this. A lot of people are in the police service who don't want to be there, but they are there. And the reason they are there is the employment options are very limited. And so you're lucky enough and you got into the police service, you are there. What it means is that the passion and the dedication to the police cause is not there. Yet you are dealing with a, 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 um, you're dealing with a particular profession which exposes you to, to daily risk. So if you balance this with the lack of desire and the passion and the fact that for many of them, they are policing wealth, which they think they otherwise also deserve, but for some reason they don't have. And their salary may not be that great and they have to now put their lives down for you. You have these very difficult mixtures, and sometimes some police officers simply don't have the desire to actually go the length of doing what original policing is meant to be, um, because that's frankly not something they're meant to be. Thank you very much, Professor Bochi, and I'll have to give the last word to ACP Kwesi for you. So quickly, can you address the question raised about the security for female police officers, and then is it realistic really to get um, you know, intelligence really at the local level? Uh, thank you very much. Um, Measures have been taken in you know, regarding our police women. The Department of Counseling have been taxed, you know, through the Association of Police Women and our regional, divisional, and district platforms, you know, to discuss essential matters that border on their activities in private and official lives. And I think that is being taken seriously. And regarding the incident that you cited, uh, not the police that caused it, but it is a criminal design by some criminals. And that thing has been dealt with according to the laws of this country. But I can show you that our women are so dear to the police administration they will make sure that they protect them. They will make sure that the Department of Counseling, you know, take them through a lot of things, psychologically, socially, and what have you. And then to what my good friend raised regarding having a third, you know, or a mid structure. I can say that the Ghana police, we have it. We have the form police unit, formerly the Amoka Squadron which, you know, had that push chart, everything, you know, in terms of restoring law and order. We have the rapid deployment force, the counter-terrorism, and the SWAT teams. But one thing is looking at the history of this country, the developments in this country, we have something we call the calm life, police, military patrols, that have been there for decades and it's been refined and they have that civil posture in dealing with some issues. But one thing is the police is capable of policing and we still trust that that big trust among the security services that the Ghana Armed Forces, the police immigration. Even during the elections, we deploy immigration officers to assist. And it's that partnership is what we hold Ghana. You, we cannot go solo looking at our sociocultural background, political, and what have you, and we will continue our security agencies to coordinate and partner in seeing to it that we provide the best of security to our people. But when it comes to some isolated incidents, that does not take away the good things that the security services are doing. Okay, so I'll have to hold you there, ACP Kwesi, for a 
quick one final point from you, Honorable Tobu. Yes, quick. Um, I just want to appeal to the because new... he mentioned something about political will. Yes. Just quickly, I want to appeal to the new Inspector General of Police to take sexual exploitation and abuse seriously. As he intends to bring some reforms to the Ghana Police Service. Political will, of course. As a member of parliament and a member of the Defense and Interior Committee, without political will, no, no security reform can succeed in this country. And we should stand on our feet to ensure that government, at any point in time, will do what is right. Thank you so much. I want, okay, Mr. Mukhtar, we have 30 seconds for you. Quick Thank one. Thank you very much. I'm, I've been listening to the conversation. And uh, I want to make the point that in having these conversations about security, and especially when it comes to violent extremism, Let's not have a conversation that uh, uh, may suggest or dismiss the idea that the threat of violent extremism is real or significant here. Otherwise, we'll risk being ambushed by you know, situations, as we've seen in several parts within West Africa. Uh, of course, we cannot fix this country until we fix the youth of this country. And I strongly believe in that. And that lends credit to what my brother Adib was talking about and another uh, speaker here. And it's important that we fix the youth of this country in terms of what we're talking about, youth opportunities, creating job opportunities for young people, and dealing with issues of marginalization and conflict situations. Lastly, uh, we all say that events in security or security incidents are less important than our reactions to them. All the things we talk about, security events will happen, either Ghana or America or Europe, anywhere else in the world. Security events happen daily. The single biggest factor that determines the resilience and preparedness of security is the response. The disaster management response services, emergency services. In the UK, 2012, I was there in London when a young guy, you know, two young guys killed a military, a serving military officer, Lee Rigby, and I'm very sure my big brother knows about this case. On the street, he killed, they killed this man, emergency services arrived, security arrived, and shot these two gentlemen on the ground. They actually took them to the hospital for medical attention. Make sure they do not die, but face justice. Responses are key to ensuring you know, confidence in the system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all our guests, uh, ACP Kwesi Fouri, who is the Acting Director, Public Affairs, Ghana Police Service, uh, Professor Kofi Abochi, Dean, UPSA Law School, Mr. Mumuni Mokhtar, Executive Director, West Africa Center for Counter Extremism, and PNK Abram Pamensa, Se Senior Programs Officer and Lead Security Governance Team, CDD Ghana, and Honorable Peter Tobu, MP for Wawes, Member of the Defense and Interior Committee in Parliament. My name is Jifa Bampo coming to you from Adisawe Kanda from 3FM and TV3. Thank you very much for joining us over the last two hours for our thought leadership program tackling uh, security in Ghana, options for action. We now go back to the studios for the midday news.